Well, good morning and welcome to River Church Online Worship. Today we continue our series, The Great Exchange, and we're talking about a topic that's relevant to every one of us, and that is fear. We all struggle with it. And today the great exchange is that God wants to take our fear, exchange it for a boldness, a new way of living. Fear, it affects my life as your pastor. Uh, there, there, there's been a time where I've forgotten to take back an item, for instance, to the store. Maybe it's a $50 item. And I, the, the 60 days passed and I, I found it one day and I think to myself, oh no, I forgot to return the item. I've lost $50 and then my irrational fear tells me, well, now I'm going to retire in poverty, right? Irrational fear. You probably can relate. My, 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 my son, my 11-year-old son, asked me to go out and play basketball on a, on a hot summer evening. I've been working all day. I've come home tired. But I, I go. I do play basketball, but I quit 30 minutes before sunset. I don't play all the way till it's pitch dark outside. I come in, and then later that evening, irrational fear. I think, oh, I'm a terrible dad. And my, my children, when they're adults, they're going to need counseling over their family of origin issues, right? Uh, irrational fear, it, it gets me, and I, I bet it gets you too at times. Some quotes regarding fear that are familiar, probably FDR, FDR's quote uh, is probably the most famous. It, so first of all, he says, uh, so first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed effort to convert retreat into advance. Retreat being a fearful life, advance being a life of courage. Another quote, fear is the path to the dark side, Yoda. Another quote, you have never experienced true fear until a poster falls off your wall in the middle of the night, <laughs> author unknown. And last quote, Mark Twain, I've had a lot of worries in my life, most of which never happened. <laughs> fear, do you struggle with it? I bet you do. Fear lives in the cracks and the crevices of my very soul. And, and that fear, it goes unchecked at times. It, it goes unbridled, untamed, and it, it grows like a wild fire. And I believe the Bible makes a case that, 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 that God's perspective on his children's fear, his, his utter disappointment, is much like my disappointment as a parent when my child keeps a secret fear to himself or to herself. As a parent, I say like, ah, oh, oh, but I, I could have helped you with that. If only you had had enough confidence in me to, to, to share uh, your, your secret fear. I'm your daddy. I, I can help you with these kinds of things. And, and when a kid asks me to help get him out of a jam, like, dad, I, I have this fear. Can you help me? with? Oh, it's so esteeming. It makes me feel so good. It's so honoring. And that's how God sees our cries for help in the midst of our fear. He understands. And when we cry out in, in our fear, when we cry out for help, it's a form of praise and honor, and it brings him glory. And, and, and when we live in silent fear, he sees that as the opposite of praise and glory. There's a story in the book of Matthew of a worker, an employee who didn't trust the Lord with his career and didn't trust the Lord with his finances. And, and we'll end with that story today. But today, first of all, we, we meet one of the most fearful characters in the entire Bible. And you're going to be surprised by who that person is. His name is King Saul. He's a king. And he struggles with fear. He, he's said to be the most handsome man in all of Israel. And he's said to be a man that is head and shoulders taller than anyone else in Israel. And yet, he was often paralyzed by fear. Let's read from 1 Samuel 9. Samuel was a great prophet of the day. 1 Samuel 9 says, There was a wealthy, influential man named Kish from the tribe of Benjamin. He was the son of Abiel, son of Zerah, son of Becherath, son of Aphiah of the tribe of Benjamin. His son Saul was the most handsome man in Israel, head and shoulders taller than anyone else in the land. He's the man for the job. He's the next, he's the first king of the nation of Israel. So the prophet Samuel comes to anoint him and say, you're God's chosen man for the job. For Samuel 10, then Samuel took a flask of olive oil and poured it over Saul's head, which in the day was a way of honoring and 
and, and, and appointing someone for a job. He kissed Saul and said, I am doing this because the Lord has appointed you to be the ruler over Israel, his special possession. Moving on to verse 9. As Saul turned and started to leave, God gave him a new heart. And all Samuel's signs were fulfilled that day. So, so God anoints this, this young man, Saul, most handsome man in the land, head and shoulders taller than anyone else. God appoints him, anoints him as the king. He gives him a new heart. Things begin to change that day. Verse 20, so Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel before the Lord, and the tribe of Benjamin was chosen by Lot. Then he brought each family of the tribe of Benjamin before the Lord, and, and, the, and, and uh, the family of the Matrites was chosen. And finally Saul, son of Kish, was chosen from among them. Like so that he's this big formal ceremony. And he, Here's your man, young Saul. He's our first king. He was chosen. But when they looked for him, he had disappeared. Saul couldn't be found. So they asked the Lord, where is he? And the Lord replied, he is hiding among the baggage. So they found him and brought him out. And he stood head and shoulders above anyone else. Then Samuel said out to all the people, this is the man the Lord has chosen as your king. No one in all Israel is like him. And all the people shouted, long live the king. They had to go find him in the baggage section, like at the airport, like where all the, the, the lost and found, like he's hiding back there behind the Samsonite. And, and, and they, they drag him out, long live the king. And thus begins Saul's illustrious career as the first king of Israel. And don't lose sight of the fact that from day one of his reign until, you'll see this, the day he died by his own hand, by his own sword. From day one to the last day, Saul was constantly in fear. He was in fear of his enemies. He was in fear of his allies. He, was, he feared his friends and his foes. He feared what his subjects, his kingdom, what they thought about him. He, he feared that the Lord was going to show up too late in battle, uh, fearful all the time. We don't have time to read every story today, but I'm going to give you a few other choice readings so you'll you get the sense of this, the depth of his fear. So after a lifetime of leading his king in fear, one day the Lord expresses, get this, regret that, that he had anointed King Saul, who, who had so much going for him. Re regret that, that, that this, this young man, King Saul, he didn't trust the Lord. He didn't lean on the Lord in times of trouble. 1 Samuel 15 says, Then the Lord said to Samuel, I am sorry that I ever made Saul king, for he has not been loyal to me and has refused to obey my command. Samuel, Samuel that's the prophet, was so deeply moved when he heard this that he cried out to the Lord all night. Verse 17, and Samuel told Saul, although you may think little of yourself, are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? The, the Lord has anointed you king of Israel. He's still trying to give him a pep talk. Come on, man, you can do this. First Samuel 18, when the victorious Israelite army was returning home after David had killed the Philistine, remember the King David, but he's not yet king. Young David, he'd killed uh, the, 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 the giant Goliath. When that happened, they're returning. Women from all the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul. And they sang this song and they danced for joy with tambourines and cymbals. And, and this was their song. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. And this made Saul very angry. What's this, he said. They credit David with ten thousands and me with only thousands. Next, they'll be making him their king. So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on young David. Verse 12, Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him, but it departed from Saul. So Saul removed David from his presence and made him a commander of a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. And David had success in all his undertakings, for the Lord was with him. And when Saul saw that he had great su success, he stood in fearful awe of David. But all Israel and Judah loved David, for he went out and he came in 
among them. Just a few more readings. First Samuel 28, it says, The Philistines set up their camps at Shunem, and Saul gathered all the army of Israel and camped at Gilboa. When Saul saw the vast Philistine army, he, began to, uh, he, began, he became frantic with fear. He asked the Lord what he should do, but the Lord refused to answer him, either by dreams or by sacred lots or by the prophets. Saul then said to his advisors, Find a woman who is a medium, that means a witch, so I can go and ask her what to do. That's the, the depths to which this situation has now arrived. The, the low point. King Saul, God's chosen man, is now seeking the wisdom and the advice of a witch. Last reading from 1 Samuel. Chapter 31, now the Philistines attacked Israel and the men of Israel fled before them. Many were slaughtered on the slopes of the Mount Gilboa. Then, then the Philistines closed in on Saul and his sons. They killed his three sons. The fighting grew very fierce around Saul. The, Philist, the Philistine archers, um, they, they caught up with him and they wounded him. Saul groaned to his armor bearer and get this. Take your sword and kill me before these pagan Philistines come to run me through and taunt and torture me. But his armor bearer wouldn't do it, so Saul took his own sword and fell on it. In his final hour, in his final hour, Saul, he spends his time fearful that his enemy would, 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 would catch him, would torture him. So he tries, he, by the way, wasn't even successful. Somebody had, else had to finish the job, but he tries to take his own life because he's now fearful that his enemies are going to torture him. His entire life is spent in Fear. Now look at this from a Christian perspective. Here's the question. What is at stake when fear rules my heart? What's at stake? I think the big question is this. Is God sufficient? Is God able to give me all that I need? Or is he not? And if he's not, then I should live in fear, in terror. Is, is, is God able to finish what he started in my life? Fear was Saul's fatal flaw. And if we aren't careful, it could be ours as well. The most handsome man in Israel, apparently the tallest man in Israel, he, he came from a, a family of wealth and privilege. The Lord had ordained him as king. And his first act as the anointed king he goes missing, hiding in the luggage bin. I, mean, I just imagine this tall man, you know, knees up to his, his, uh, his, his chin, like crouched down, hiding behind the Samsonite as best as he can. And, and frankly, that's how he lived his entire life. That's the picture that his closest confidants had of him. Saul hiding in the corner. The point is this. Your fear is not usually caused by your circumstances. And your fear won't usually be cured by the bettering of your circumstance. If anyone had reason not to be fearful, it was Saul. I mean, his circumstances dictated great courage. And, and for you, there are probably many people in your life they would look at you and say, you have no reason to fear. And you might say, well, well thanks, Pastor Randy. That's no help at all. But, but here's my point. Here's my point. Freedom from fear is closer than we think. And it doesn't require us getting every danger around us in check before we can no longer live in fear. It's not your circumstances that, that is really dogging you. It's your perspective. What if you could live fearlessly? What if you could get up in the morning and be driven by some motive other than fear? Again, the question that I, that I posed earlier, what is at stake here? And I think the answer is this question of whether or not God is really able Jesus told a, a, a fascinating story in, in Matthew chapter 25. It's a sermon about the talents. You, you may know it that way. It's, it's, it goes like this. The, 
there's a, there's a manager, a boss, and he gives his workers uh, a certain sum of money. To, to when he gives five talents, that's a sum of money, to the, to the next he gives two, and to the next he gives one. And he goes away, and he comes back to see what his servants or his employees had done with these, these sums of money, these talents. And, and uh, so the, 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 the one that received five talents had, had doubled his money. He'd been industrious. He'd worked with it. And, and the, the employer says, well done. The, the employee who had received two doubled his money as well. And the, employee say, or the, the employer says, well, well done, good and faithful servant. You have, you have been faithful over a little. I will, I will set you over much in joy uh, or enter into the joy of your, your master, your boss. But then the one who received only one talent well, let's read. Matthew 25, it says, He also who had received the one talent came forward. Remember, the guy that got five, he doubled it. The guy that got two, he doubled it. The one that got one, he came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. You're a hard employee so, or employer. So I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground. Here. You have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful or, or uh, lazy slave, for, for, to everyone who is, for to everyone who has will more be given, and, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, I realize this seems like way over the top. Seems harsh, right? But here's the point. God cannot work in tandem with fear in your life. It's, it's like one or the other. I mean, I don't know if you catch what I, what I read just a second ago, but, but this... This servant or employee received one talent. The first thing he said was, I was afraid. I was afraid, so I went and I, I dug a hole and I buried the talent. He did nothing with what had been given him as an investment. Again, God cannot work in tandem with fear. In my life, he just won't do it. He won't partner with fear. What we have here is a worker who doesn't trust his Lord with his career, doesn't trust his Lord with his finances. He says, I'm not sure you're good. I'm not sure you can be trusted. I'm not sure that as my Lord, you're going to do right by me. So instead of acting in courage, I'm just going to go act in fear. I'm just going to go dig a hole and bury it because I'm not sure I can trust you. I don't want to lose this. This one, here you go. I didn't do anything with it. I acted in fear. And, and I mean, obviously, that sounds somewhat familiar, right? I mean, we can relate to this sort of action, this sort of mindset. You, you see, love and fear, fear and love, they're such polar opposites that, that both cannot coexist in our hearts. There's just polar opposites that you cannot both hold on to Jesus and hold on to your fears and, and, and see them as a happy partnership. Um, so are you struggling? Are you struggling with this, this, this belief today that God is good? God is doing good in my life. Well, I would say this. He, he's hold, held you together to this point. He's, he's, he's gotten you this far Let's, let's begin to, to um, explore the possibility that, that he's going to finish what he started, that, that the best is yet to come. 1 John 4 says this, chapter, uh, verse 18, it says, There is no fear in love, but, but love casts out fear. I love what, what Eugene Peterson did with this passage in the message. It says this, 
it's the same, it's his paraphrase of the same passage. There is no room in love for fear. Well-formed love banishes fear. Since fear is crippling, a fearful life, fear of death, fear of judgment, is one not yet fully formed. Again, I say, the Lord has carried you this far. In your fear, in your worry, in your, in your, in your disbelief at times, nonetheless, nonetheless, the Lord has carried you this far. He's held you together to this point. Let us now explore the possibility that he will finish what he started, the possibility that, that, that the best is yet to come. I've got an action plan. Six different um, steps that we can take. Uh, you may want to write these down. Think about these the rest of the week. Talk with your friends about it. Pray with your spouse about it. Share them with your kids. Maybe as a family, make it a goal. How can we, how can we kids, how can we overcome fear that, that just reigns and rules in our hearts too often and too long? Action plan number one. I'm going to say fear is doing me no good. In fact, fear is doing me long-term damage. Can you embrace that? I think that's a pretty easy sell. I think we realize that. It, it's, it's not doing me. It, it, it makes my stomach hurt. It, it causes me to stay up at night. I, I get up in the mornings and, and I have to remember, oh yeah, what is it that I'm fearful of? And then, I, and then I make a game plan for the day based on that fear that I'd sort of forgotten over the night, but now I have to rekindle in my soul. It's doing me no good. So, so, so let's, let's begin with that point. There's, there's, there's a better way. There, there's, there's a better way. Number two, action plan number two. I'm going to embrace the truth that fear is irrational. I want to embrace that. I want to, I want to believe that. It, it's ira- it doesn't even make any sense. Uh, there was a study recently. Um, I could send you the link if you want it later on. It says that perhaps as, as much as 90% of the things that you have feared in life never come to pass. And, and of, that, of those 10% of the, the things that do come to pass, something like 7% of them, they, they work themselves out in, in such that they're not even problems because even though they come to pass, they, they work themselves out. And something like 2% of the things that, that, that we uh, fear even happen at all. I, I, I sat down yesterday with my kids and with Lydia and we took stock of just some of the ways that the Lord has blessed us in the last year. And I said, you know, kids, I, I worry about life and I, 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 I put all my attention on the possibility of calamity and bad things that are going to happen. And yet I, I forget about, I don't even celebrate the things that, that God is doing, has done, even to this day. Our action plan, number one, I'm going to embrace that fear is doing me no good. Number two, I'm going to embrace that, that fear is irrational. Number three, I'm going to close up shop on this space that I've made for fear in my life. You see, I, I often I make room for fear in my life. Like, like I give the space, meaning I give over time, uh, I give over my attention. I, I, I maybe even maybe even invite other people into this little space where where we allow fear to to foster and to grow. But I'm gonna I'm gonna close up shop on that. I'm gonna say no. You have no space. You have no place. You have no right in my life. So number four, number four, going forward, I'm gonna fill the room with love and thankfulness instead of fear. That space, I'm closing up shop. Fear no longer resides here. Now, love and thankfulness will live, will thrive, will be welcome. Action plan number five. Um, I, I, I'm going to believe that trusting God actually makes sense. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rest in the Lord. I'm going to trust that he is good and that he does good. And I'm going to tell myself, this actually makes sense. You see, you see I, I tell others all the time, like, like, trust in the Lord. 
He is good. He will do good. And I mean it. And I bet you tell other people that. I bet you tell other people the Lord has carried you this far. He's trustworthy. He's good God. You can, you can lean into the Lord. You can trust him. And yet, and yet, I need to preach that to myself. You need to preach that to yourself the way that you preach that to others. I must make time to, to, to rest in the Lord, to rest each day in the Lord, to, to, to trust in, to, to lean in, to, to rest on his promises. And, and action step number six, I want to stop and pray, and, and celebrate what the Lord has already done in my life to this date. To simplify these action plans, really what I've said is really kind of a two-part step. One is, uh, I'm going to embrace the truth that, that, that fear is irrational, and fear is only doing me damage. In fact, long-term, serious damage, it needs to be dealt with. And then the second part of this, 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 whole, this whole action plan, the second part is I've got this room in my heart where fear has, reside, has resided for too long. I'm going to close up shop, but instead in that space, uh, now love and, and prayer and, and thankfulness and, and celebration will thrive, will be fostered, where I go before the Lord and I say, you have been good to date. You have... To, to this day in my life, you've been good. You haven't dropped me. You, you haven't quit on me. You haven't failed me. And I'm going to trust that what you have begun in me, you will finish in me. There's, there's another part to this. And, and that is, for non-Christians, this, this would sound odd. But you see, in the kingdom of God, which is where, where we live as Christians, our existence as, as, as kingdom citizens, as children of God, in the kingdom of God, I also have nothing to fear because even when, if I lose, I win. In the kingdom of God, even if I lose, I win because we realize well, we just got a few years on this earth, you know. And but 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 the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, my my existence, how I'm going to live with Jesus that that's for eternity. And so even if I lose in the short game, I win. I win because I created for eternity. Eternity with God. So what do we do today? What we do is we, we return to our heavenly daddy and we say, I believe that your ways are best. I, I believe that your plan is, is good. I, I believe that what you've started in my life, you're going to finish in my life. I'm going to rest in that, Lord. Oh, friends, I, I pray for you. I pray that, that, that fear, which is, for some of you, it's, been a, it's dogged you your entire life. I, I pray that the Lord will begin to lift that like a, like a like the, like fog that's lifting and that, that the sunlight of his love would, would shine, would burn off all the fog of fear in your life. And, and you'd be able to, to wake up in the morning with a different motivation, not the motivation of fear, but the motivation of courage, the motivation of, of love, the motivation that says, what might God want to do in my life today? And the motivation that says, what might God want to do through me in another person's life today? Let me pray for you. God, I pray that you would lift the fog of fear for me, for my friends. And this is a heavy, heavy uh, task. Uh, really, it's not an easy thing to do for us, but but we trust that you can do it. Would you begin to lift the fog of fear? And would you give in us a, a, a new sense of, of trust and faith that we could lean in, that you, you have been good and you are good and you're doing good. Give us a new sense of faith that, that what you've begun in our lives, you're going to see it to the end. You're going to finish it. We, we love you. We rest in your goodness. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, friends, it's been good to be with you today. Um, more and more people are coming back, returning to in-person worship. Some of you are continuing to self-isolate 
And I encourage you, you go with your conscience. We're going to continue making these videos just for you. I encourage you right now, go online, riverchurchrgv.com, and, and give. Everything that we do uh, in this ministry of River Church, it's supported. It's based on your good gifts. So I thank you for that. If you have any questions or wondering what's going on at River Church, go to the website. All things River Church can be found there. If you want to get in contact with the elders, if we can pray for you, if there's a need that we can meet, send me an email, randy at riverchurchrgv.com, and I'll distribute that to the other elders, and we will we'll help you in any way that we can. I love you. I'm praying for you. I want the best for you. I can't wait to see you again in person soon. But for now, you take care and have a good day.